So, first of all, what is a streaming table function? The word streaming refers to a process in which data is transformed from one step to the next in a stream of events, all staying within the single SQL statement. So, for example, we might take data that's sitting inside the transactional OLTP database, apply a transformation to move it into a first stage of change, then apply a second transformation, moving it into the next form, and a final transformation into the decision support system or data warehouse. So let's take a look at what it will take to build a streaming table function, because it involves functions, select statements, and something new, the cursor expression. Before diving into the implementation of a streaming table function, let's take a look at how it looks inside a SQL statement. So what I'll be showing you is the following. Take all the data from the stocks table. Notice it's not a dynamic SQL string, it's an actual select statement. Convert it into a cursor variable with the cursor expression. Pass that cursor variable into my function called doubled. That performs the algorithm of the transformation, passes back a nested table of rows. Convert that to a relational table format with the table clause. Select all the rows from that array coming back from my nested table function. Insert them into the tickers table. And here's a two-step streaming table function transformation. Take all the data from stocks, double them up using my table function, pass them back as a result set, select all the rows from that result set, pass that to a cursor expression, returning a cursor variable, pass that cursor variable to my second streaming table function. It returns an array, select all the rows from that array, and let's create a new table based on those rows. So those are two examples of using table functions within a SQL statement to stream transformations along. Now let's take a look at how you build this stuff. Okay, let's get this show on the road. So the first thing I'm gonna do is create my stocks table. Every row in the stocks table has a ticker symbol like ORCL, the date of the trade, the price at the opening of the day, and the price at the closing of the day. And we'll put in some data. Let's say a thousand rows, STK one, two, three, four, five, and we're gonna be really optimistic. All the stocks go up. Table created, table populated. Next. Here's where I wanna put the data. So I'm gonna move the data from the stocks table to the tickers table. It's a one to two split. So for everyone in the stocks table, I have the ticker, the date of the activity, the price type, whether it's an open row or a closed row, and the price, the open price or the closed price. Very simple algorithm. You don't even need to use PLSQL and a table function to do this kind of transformation. And if you can do it all in SQL, you should. But let's assume that the algorithm is very complicated. The transformation has to take place using PLSQL, and therefore we're gonna build a table function around this doubling logic. So let's create that tickers table. Good job, Oracle. Okay, so I got my stocks table, I've got my tickers table. Now, as you hopefully will recall from the video on returning multiple columns in a table function, I need to create an object type that has all the columns that I want to return. Now, in this case, I'm not just returning columns of data, rows of data with multiple columns. I'm putting that data into the tickers table. So the, the columns that are returned in my nested table have to match the columns in my tickers table. And as you may recall from my second module on returning multiple columns, you can't use table percent row type when you're creating your nested table type. Instead, you create an object type that mimics the structure of the tickers table. And then you create a nested table on top of those object types as follows. So now I've got my tickers table. I've got my object type that matches my ticker table, and I've got my array of those object types. Next. Now, this is something new. With a streaming table function, as I mentioned at the very beginning, we're gonna be taking a select statement, rows and columns returned by a select statement, and pass them into my table function. And the way I'm gonna do that is I'm gonna convert that select statement or the results out of that select statement into a cursor variable. And I do that by calling the cursor expression. But when I create my table function parameter for that cursor variable, I have to tell it what type of data is being passed in in that cursor variable. And to do that, I need to define a strong ref cursor type. So in my package, stock manager, 
I'm going to declare the stocks ref cursor. So it's a type that in which every row returned by a cursor variable of this type looks like a row from the stocks table. I'm also going to create another ref cursor called tickers that I'm going to use in my second phase of multiple transformations. And that's another ref cursor. Any variable def defined on this type returns rows that have the same structure as the tickers table. Create my package. Good. Great. OK. Now it's time to look at the table function. Now before looking into the implementation of the function, let's do a quick reminder of how it's going to be used. Remember with a streaming table function, everything happens within a single SQL statement. So I'm going to be building the doubled function. And the purpose of the doubled function is to double up rows from the stocks table. One row in the stocks table to two rows in the ticker table. The way I'm going to do that is I'm going to pass in all the data from the stocks table by doing a select star from stocks into my doubled function. So it's a parameter coming in. Now, you can't pass a select uh, a data set returned by a select statement directly into a PLSQL function. You could pass an array of the data, but that's not what we're looking at here. What I want to do, though, is use the cursor expression to pass in a cursor variable that is contains the contents of the result set from that select statement. So that will determine the parameter in a streaming table function. Streaming table functions don't have to have only cursor variable parameters, but generally speaking, at least one of them is going to be a cursor variable of that data coming in. OK, now let's take a look at the function itself. So we'll start by taking a look at the header of the doubled function, as well as the declaration section. And my function doubled takes in a bunch of rows of this type and returns a nested table of those ticker object types. Now, just to refresh your memory, this rows in is a ref cursor type. So here's my stock manager package. I declare my type stocks RC of type ref cursor. So that means it's a ref cursor, which means anything declared on this type is a cursor variable. There are two types of cursor variables or ref cursor types, strong and weak. This is a strong ref cursor type, which is required in this case. And what, I'm, what that means is that I'm describing, I'm defining as part of the type declaration what each row returned by this cursor variable looks like, the number and types of the expressions or columns. In this case, I'm saying any row returned through this cursor variable has the same structure as the stocks table, which of course makes sense since we're selecting select star from stocks as the input to this function. OK, so get a bunch of rows coming in as a cursor variable. Return my nested table. Now, since I'm getting a bunch of rows in a cursor variable, I'm going to have to iterate through those rows to then process them in whatever my algorithm is, in this case, doubling a 1 to 2 split, passing them back out. Generally speaking, I could use a cursor for loop, or not a cursor for loop, but loop through the cursor variable rows, row by row. But that's slow. That's row by row processing. So in general, inside a table function, you're likely to find the declaration of an array to grab the data out of the cursor variable in a high-speed performance using bulk collect, and then iterate through them and apply the algorithm. So that's what I'm going to do here. I'm going to declare an index by table, or an associative array, indexed by integer, in which each element of the array has the same structure as the row in the stocks table, just like the rows coming in. And there's my variable based on that type. Next, I'm going to declare the collection that I'm going to build out that will then be returned. And this has to be of type tickers nested table, because that's what I'm returning. Now let's explore the implementation of the doubled function. Now on the one hand, who cares what the implementation is? The point here is that it's going to be different for every single table function. And as I mentioned before, if you can do it in SQL, and you don't need to use PLSQL to do the algorithm for the transformation, do it in SQL. But the general process of building the table function to, to construct and then return a nested table or VRA it's going to follow a similar pattern, and that's really what I want to get across to you here. So we've got a whole bunch of rows coming in through the parameter interface via a cursor variable. I need to fetch those rows, do my transformations, put them in the collection, and pass the collection back out. Now I want to make sure that the performance is as top-notch as possible. So one of the key elements of that is to not fetch the data from the row set coming in on a row-by-row -row basis. Now I can't use a cursor for loop with a cursor variable. That would have automatically fetched 100 rows at a time. What I can do, though, is loop through that data set 
with a fetch bulk collect limit statement, and that will fetch n number of rows with each retrieval from the database. So in this case, I've got a limit set to 100. It's probably a good default value. If you're using or processing very large amounts of data, you could even try a larger limit of, say, 1,000 or 10,000. The larger the limit number, the more process global area PGA per session memory you're going to be consuming. So you just have to watch out for that. So I fetch 100 rows from my result set, and then I stop when there's nothing in the array. That's the target of all the uh, 100 rows. Assuming I've got something, then I've got a numeric for loop that says go through each of those rows that are in the array. And then here's the part that I'm doing the transformation, the two to one split. Again, very much application specific, but just to explain the code that you're looking at, I'm going to make room in my nested table. I have to extend to make room for the new rows. I'm going to populate that new last row with an object type. So I'm calling the constructor function of the type. I'm passing it the ticker symbol, the trade date, O for the open price and the open price. Then I'm going to extend again and assign to this new last row another object type instance, the ticker symbol, the trade date, the fact that this is the close row, and the close price. So I do that for those 100 rows over and over and over again until there's nothing left. Then I come out, I close my cursor variable, and then I return my nested table. And that nested table invoked within the table clause is converted into the relational data set and then can be processed as part of a SQL statement. So let's take a look at this function in action. Here's my insert into select star statement. So I take the select star from stocks. I take all the data in the stocks table. I pass it as a parameter to doubled by putting it inside the cursor expression which returns a cursor variable. The cursor variable is passed into the doubled function. We do that transformation I just showed you. This passes back a nested table of, let's say, 20,000 or 100,000 rows. The table clause converts it into a relational data set format. I select star from it and insert into the tickers table, which I can do because the nested table is a table of object types that have the same structure, the same number and types of attributes as the ticker's table. So let's run an insert statement. 2,000 rows inserted. Looks good. Let's just verify that with an actual select statement of its own. 2,000 rows. Let's take a look at some of the data. So as you can see, we've got open rows and close rows and the different price variations and the different stock tickers. So it looked like it worked just fine. Nice table function. So let's finish up by showing you a two-step streaming transformation in which two different table functions are called in sequence. What I'm going to do is, of course, very simple and kind of silly. So we've already looked at a doubling process, the one to two split. Now I'm going to take a look at squeezing them back together, two rows going back to one. So I'm going to take data from the stocks table, move it into a format that's compatible with the tickers table, and then I'm going to take the ticker data and I'm going to move it back to rows into the stock table. So what I need is a stock object type and a stock nested table. So here's my object type that mimics the structure of my table. There's my nested table of those object types. Next. Here's my singled as opposed to doubled function. It follows the same pattern that I just showed you. So we're going to take in a cursor variable, this time a cursor variable of rows that look like the tickers table. I'm going to return a nested table of stock data. I've got my local collection that has that will hold the ticker rows and my array that's being returned. Again, a loop. I fetch 100 rows at a time. I stop when there's nothing fetched from my cursor variable. And then for each of the rows, each of my ticker data, I'm going to basically make room in my nested table and add to the last new last row on my nested table a single row of stock information, taking the ticker, the price date, the open price, and the close price, assuming a little bit of an increase. Then I return my nested table. Finally, here's my create table statement. So create table as select more stocks. Let's read it from the inside out. I'm going to grab all the data from the stocks table, convert it to a cursor variable, pass it to my doubled function, do the two to one split. 
That's going to return the nested table, convert it to a relational table format, select all the rows from that, and pass that as a cursor variable into my second table function, my singled table function. That takes my ticker table data, converts it into a stock format, passes back those rows of stock information, converts it to a relational table format, select all the rows from that, insert it into or create a new table based on that data set. And there you have it, folks, streaming table functions. So number one, your table function accepts a cursor variable, accepts a set of data coming in from the SQL statement itself in which you're executing your function. You use the cursor expression in that SQL statement to take the set of data converted to a cursor variable that gets passed into the table function. The table function, of course, passes back a collection, nested table or VRA, for processing through the table clause. And then you repeat that as often as needed, chaining or streaming one transformation to another until you get to the state of data that you want. And then you put it into a report, create a new table as select, whatever fits your application requirements. This video was created as part of a class on PLSQL table functions offered at the Oracle Dev Gym, devgym.oracle.com. The Dev Gym offers quizzes, workouts, and classes on Oracle technology. And we encourage you to take the class if you're not already signed up for it and check out the workouts and quizzes as well.